Welcome to our Sabbath school. Before we begin, we're going to have a moment of silent prayer. Amen. The Sabbath school for March 12, 2011. We're thankful to have Sister Raquel Orsi here, head of the publishing department, and Brother Idel Torres, president of the General Conference, to uh, give us some insights into the lesson and help us go through this very important time in history, which we can say, in all honesty, the most important thing that ever happened in the universe happened during this time. And what was that that happened during this time? The birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus Christ. I like to look at it this way. When you're reading a book and you see an asterisk, it tells you to look down. Mm -hmm. And God put an asterisk, a star, the star of Bethlehem, in the history of humanity. And he says, look down. Behold your God, your creator is becoming the most indefensive animal, the, the most indefensive mammal, the most indefensive babe. Being. Being, thank you. Being in the universe. I mean, a baby can't do anything. Animals, as soon as they're born, they're able to run, they're able to hide we as, as humans are totally indefenseless and we see almighty God, all wise God, omnipotent God becoming this babe. That to me is the most, the greatest mystery of uh, the universe and it will take eternity yes, just will. to scratch the surface. It will take eternity just to scratch the surface of that. And that's kind of what centered in our lesson last time, the historical setting of that event and who was ready for that event. That's what the lesson talked about, how few were actually ready for Jesus' coming. It was the shepherds and Anna and Simeon. Yeah, very, very few. And, of course, we know that the end of the world is going to be like that also. And so the question for us, really, what we should ask ourselves individually is, are we ready for the second coming of Christ more so than the people of that time were ready for the first coming? So we're going to look today at the fall of the Roman Empire and what led up to that and what uh, was the things that happened during the time of Jesus and afterwards uh, during the time of the Acts of the Apostles a little bit. And we're going to see what happened when the Prince of Peace confronted the entire Roman Empire and actually he's confronting the whole world today. And how is he doing that? Well... Let's study our lesson and see if we can come up with some answers to that question. So we have the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, which happened over a period of time, and we're going to talk about some of the barbaric tribes, which we call barbaric tribes, as they uh, invaded Rome, and how that relates to the actions which Rome took against Jesus Christ, because we're talking here about the law of cause and effect, and that is what we're going to see in the lesson, and we also we'll look at Pilate, his cause and effect. And now we need to apply, in the end of the lesson, cause and effect for us today, for the world today. So let's see if we can do that in our lesson as we go forth uh, with the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, Sab Sabbath, March 12, 2011. The fourth kingdom, as Daniel said, well, shall be strong as iron, and whereas thou sawest feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Now, Sister Raquel, can you comment on this text? Because this is a very poignant text. Yes, I think it's the best text for the introduction of this lesson, especially because present us the transition for one kingdom mm -hmm. to a completely different situation uh, that have to do with a division between 10 different sections of the continent. So... Um, I think it's uh, very, very important to consider that Jesus was born during this fourth uh, kingdom. Before the division took place. Right, absolutely. Yeah, be exactly in the fourth kingdom and one of the times from the em Emperor August that was one of the powerful in, at that time. And peace was there and the announcement of the angels uh, prophesied the situation and at the same time, the mission of Jesus. So they prophesied the situation and the mission, and I think that's a very important point. Uh, yes, uh, I think very often we read these Bible texts, if you permit me, Sean, sure. to read it, 
this is Luke 2, verse 14, say, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor okay. rests. This is the, the first text of the first question, which is, what beautiful promise was expressed by the angels to the shepherds when Jesus, the Prince of Peace, was born? What contrasting condition existed at that time? So speak on. Yes. Um, if we consider the first sentence, glory to God in the highest, and we um, connected this with the second sentence, we find something interesting if you compare this with the two tables of the law of God. Mm. Because the first one included the first four commandments mm -hmm. that directed the humanity to the glory of God. But the second table have to do with our relationship between human beings. And Jesus concentrate both uh, aspects in his own person. Mm -hmm. And in this way was a completely, um, if you permit the word, revolution in this situation. Mm -hmm. Because the idea was a mighty power like Rome, iron. But Jesus presents the situation in a completely different aspect. Glory to God. First four commandments, peace among mm -hmm. men, the second table of the commandments. Very good. And I'd like to add a couple of other thoughts here because when Jesus came to the Sermon on the Mount, the great constitution of his kingdom, he mentioned nothing about Rome. Right. They were expecting someone to challenge Rome, and he did that, but in a way that is most unique because he challenged the principles upon which Rome, Rome lay, mm -hmm. and that principle, of course, was pride, power, passion, and man's purpose, not God's purpose. So as we go through the lesson, we can keep that in mind. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. Providence had directed the movements of nations and the tide of human impulse and influence until the world was ripe for the coming of the deliverer. The nations were united under one government, one language was widely spoken, and everywhere recognized as the language of literature. Now, what language was that? What do you think? That had to be Greek, because the New Testament was written in Greek. When men started to write down, when the script was invented, it was around the time of Moses, and he wrote in ancient Hebrew. When the Greeks started to dominate the world, Ptolemy asked for the Old Testament to be translated into Greek, from Hebrew into mm -hmm. Greek. And he had a huge library in Alexandria, named after Alexander the Great. That was one of the great libraries of all time. And it had many volumes that had been translated into Greek. Greek was the language of literature. It still has remained the language of the classics. Mm -hmm. When you went to school, you used to learn to read Greek. We, we've lost that in America today. And when Jesus was born in that first, in that change of time, during the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire was getting more and more influence with their Latin language, but still it was Greek. Yes. It was Greek what, what people understood when he died on the cross, they wrote his title also in Greek. And I believe that in the synagogues, the Greek was read, the Septuagint. And when the New Testament was written, it was also written in Greek, just like in our own time. Mm -hmm. When Jesus appears in North America, he communicates in English, and Sister White writes in English, and the angel spoke to her in English, because that is the primary language of business today yeah. around the world. So at that time, the language that the Word of God needed to be given in was the language of the people, the language of, of those who knew how to write, and that was Greek. And we know also that in the New Testament, when they quoted the Old Testament, it's very obvious they were quoting the Greek. The Greek, that's yes. right, Septuagint. And they quoted so well, those apostles quoted so well the Old Testament in Greek that Josh McDowell says in his book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, that the Jews stopped using the Greek in their synagogues. Hmm. Because it identified Jesus so well as Messiah, yes. as the Lord, as Kurios, the Lord. Yeah. You could really quote the Old Testament in Greek to show with the New Testament that he was Messiah. So they mm -hmm. stopped quoting and using. Yeah, that was about 80 to 90 uh, AD when they, when they recognized that. 
Sister Raquel, you had a thought. Too. Yes, only to add to this, the Bible text from John 19, 7, that was, uh, 19, excuse me, verse 20, when um, Pilate uh, write the title uh, and say, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of Jews, he used Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. And the reason why he used these three, because the Aramaic was the language of the region, mm -hmm. Uh, the Latin was the civil language of the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. but the Greek language was the literature language. So in order to achieve mm -hmm. all the three levels of the society, was needed to write in the three different Yeah, we ones. have to say one more thing I'd like to add to this too. When we say that Rome conquered Greece, but Greece conquered Rome in its culture and its literature. Mm -hmm. So there was a cultural spreading of the Greek language and culture throughout the world through the Roman Empire. So we can answer that question basically that the language of the day of the common people was uh, Greek. So in all lands the Jews of the dispersion gathered to Jerusalem to the annual feast and as these returned to the place of their sojourn they could spread throughout the world tidings of the Messiah's coming. So what world power confirmed and carried out the death sentence pronounced against the Son of God. Now, I like the word confirmed because it had come through uh, the Jews, but we have to also add here that in the real context of it, it is the sins of all of humanity for which he died. It was a Roman Empire, and we know that Pontius Pilate was the governor, the representative of the Roman Empire. It was during the government of Tiberius. And when we look at history, every single person, every single people that were involved in condemning Jesus to death paid with their cities being burned and sacked. That happened to Jerusalem, and that would happen also to Rome a few centuries later when the barbarian tribes would come down. And I believe that uh, Pontius Pilate, as he was condemning Jesus and scourging Jesus, as it was the custom among the Romans, he was acting out of fear. Yeah. So here is a man that is going against his conscience. Here is a man that knows that Jesus is just, and he proclaims him several times. When you read the book of Luke, you're going to see where he says he's a just man. He's a just man. He's innocent. I have found nothing worthy of death in him. And yet he still condemns him. That is very uh, sad. And mm -hmm. to see that sometimes we as Christians also go against our conscience. And we condemn Jesus. In the book of Hebrews it says that every time we sin, we have to walk over the dead body of Christ. Mm -hmm. I know when I was a child and we would confront each other at school in the yard, in the schoolyard, we would say, over my dead body. Well, Jesus actually says that. He says, over my dead body you will sin. We have to walk over the Son of God in order to sin. He does everything possible to stop us from sinning. And he did everything possible for Pilate not to turn him over. I think that Pilate's um, example for us is very good. Have you ever heard anybody say, I really shouldn't say this or I really shouldn't do that, and then went ahead and did it? Or That's did right. That? Well, that's what Pilate did that's here what also. Pilate. And we see the consequences when a person goes against what he knows is right. How could Pilate say at one moment that he was an innocent man mm -hmm. and then beat him, have him beaten as a guilty man? I think he was thinking that if I show the people how much he's mm -hmm. suffering, maybe they'll change their mind. But that's not a proper approach. Sister mm -hmm. Raquel, you had a thought. Yes, uh, I think that very often we concentrate ourselves how Jesus rela uh, was uh, related or what kind of dialogue he had with uh, the elders, the priests in the Sanhedrin. But um, with Pilate, he used a completely different strategy. For example, uh, in Matthew 27, uh, verse 11, the governor asked to Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Before this, the high priest asked him, and Jesus don't answer anything. But he answered to Pilate. And he said, yes, it is as you say. So the same question, Jesus answered in two different ways. The first, no answer at all, because it was not needed for the high priest. He knew <laughs> who is the king, and he knew the prophecies, and he knew everything. 
and he asked this only to condemn him. That's right. Pilate asked in sincerity. There's a difference. And this is the reason why Jesus answered to him and said, you say it. So it's like this. Mm -hmm. But he tried to, to have something from Jesus that helped him or give him power to not to be as he was in reality in his character. He was a very weak person. He was accustomed to manipulate things mm -hmm. according to his own will. But now he was confronted with the truth. And he knew that he was not a common man, what he was in front of, hi of him. So he, has, he asked him then, what is the truth? Problem is, he didn't wait to hear the answer. And I'm this sorry. is the problem. Mm -hmm. So he took his own decision. Right. He knew he is the king. He knew he's God. I'd like to point out one other thing here, too. If you study what Jesus said before the Sanhedrin, they were, like you said, asking him things to get him to condemn himself in his own words. Mm -hmm. He was not defending himself. Right. But when he was asked to defend God, he spoke. Right. So I think that's an important point for us also because as Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, he would not speak of himself, and he even said of himself he didn't do that. There were times he did, and they accused him of speaking of himself, and he says, I have other witnesses besides. But here in the court before the Sanhedrin, he didn't defend himself, but he did not deny God. He had to answer when it, God was, God's kingdom was challenged. That is when he spoke. Because there's another reason there. They had heard his words. They had seen him face to face. He had talked to them. He had warned them. He had given them instruction. And so they were acting according against all those things. Well, Pilate hadn't had that opportunity yet. Right. So there's a different situation, a different motive, and Jesus, being the person he was, seeing in the heart, he knew what he had to do to try to help Pilate. Now, Pilate's crime and consequences, we've kind of sort of studied. Um, how did Pilate's career end? We're looking at the second subtitle. How can we say about that? Unfortunately, a very sad case. Pilate ended by taking his life. He committed suicide. Judas took his own life. And many of the Jews took their lives also within the stronghold of Masada. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> when we reject God, we're rejecting life because Jesus is the life of men. That's how the Gospel of John starts. Now, God did everything possible to avoid this awful turn of events in the life of Pontius Pilate. His wife, the wife of Pontius Pilate, that somehow was related to Tiberius Caesar from what I've been reading, she had a dream. And in that dream, she says that Jesus was a just man mm. yeah. and that she suffered much for him. It, she saw Jesus coming in his second coming, in her dream. Wow. And she saw these men that had pierced him, that had crucified him, resurrected and being there to see Christ coming in his glory. And I tell you that she feared for her husband, she feared for her own life, and she said, have nothing to do with him. I can imagine her writing a note and calling a servant and say, run, take it immediately to Pilate, let him read that. And there are apocryphal copies of that. I mean, we don't have the real thing. But we can imagine what this script did, that Pilate, when he reads this, this man runs in, his servant, and gives him a message from his wife, and he reads it, he turns pale. He's really frightened. He really is going to try everything possible to free him. But he loved his position yeah. more than he loved justice, more than he loved truth and that's our problem today also well, when we yeah. put something over God when we love we love the truth we love the message but we really love our TV more or we really love our music more or we really love whatever it is more than God then that is the road to the highway to hell yeah uh, the first commandment says you will have no other gods before me Pilate had another God he was listening to the people Yes, he was listening. He was wavering. His indecision proved his ruin. If we waver at the truth, if we are in, indecided 
undecided on keeping the Sabbath, on giving tithe, we will fail. We have to act by faith. Well, God has given us all these little things. Uh, family, he's given us means, he's given us talent, he's given us time. How are we doing with these little things? And the use of these little things is going to tell the, the history of our lives in the bigger things. And we need to emphasize that in our own selves personally. Not look around to other people, but let's be faithful in the little things because that is what will show off in the bigger things. And it, how wonderful it is that Pilate had a God-fearing wife. We should really appreciate when we have a God-fearing husband and a God-fearing wife. We should treasure that as the greatest treasure and, uh, you might say, uh, stewardship that we have in our Christian walk. This should be something that is very much more appreciated. Well, let's go on. We kind of discussed this, um, how did uh, Pilate's career end? So the fatal co consequences now you've mentioned also to the Jewish people. Likewise, we see there's a consequence here of cause and effect. What happened to the Jews after they rejected the Prince of Peace? Sister Raquel, what can we say about this? Yes, uh, Jesus in different occasions present the future to the Hebrew nation. But especially in these questions, we can consider two declarations, one from Luke 19, the other one from Matthew 22. The first was especially sad because the Bible tells us that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. While everybody was rejoicing, yes. he was crying because he saw what was going to happen. Absolutely. So we find in this Bible text that he described until the details all the military logistics that Titus, the Roman general, will use to destroy Jerusalem to the ground. And he presented this very clear when say, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. So mm -hmm. in this first declaration, we find the military logistic and also the prophetical aspect from Daniel 9. Now, in Matthew 22, Jesus used a parable. And this is uh, like a more extended explanation mm -hmm. of this situation because it's more the spiritual aspect that is emphasized. So we see the first calling, uh, how this calling was rejected, how some of the invited persons went so far that killed the servants that give the message. And that was like a codified uh, a message also for them at that time, because we know that they killed uh, John the Baptist and Jesus also, and they he, Jesus himself presented this uh, message to come back to God. After soldiers will come and with fire, they will destroy everything. Mm -hmm. And that was the year 70 when, when the city was completely destroyed. But at the same time was another calling also giving to all the people, not only to them. Mm -hmm. So if we go in the details in this parable, we see that God never depend on people to fulfill his plans. He depends only on faithfulness of people. Yeah, that's a very important difference. And uh, the Hebrew nation forgot completely this principle. They thought that they are people of God because they are, and they mm -hmm. cannot be changed. And they inherit these promises and these privileges, and nobody can take this yeah. from them. So they forgot the origin of this situation. We can go back here too, and if we look at their situation, where they were, they had before that time, in the time of Daniel, um, at the end of the Babylonian, uh, well, at the beginning of the Babylonian captivity, they had the example of Hezekiah, who thought he was the people of God, and that no one could take Jerusalem, because God had protected it in the time of Hezekiah, and therefore it wasn't going to fall. But now they have, in their experience, the example of Zedekiah, and of that time. And so they, shouldn't have, they should have been told, they should have understood what could have happened to Jerusalem because of unfaithfulness. Now, let's project it just for a second or two down to the end of time because Jesus in Matthew 24 said he answered what it was going to be like in the time of the Jews 
but also at the time of the end. So we today not only have the time of Zedekiah and the time of Pilate, uh, uh, not, as the Jews had the time of Zedekiah, we have both Zedekiah and the time of Pilate and Herod, to, mm -hmm. for example, for us. So we are doubly warned. Now I'd like to mention one more thing as we go into the, this, this lesson. It says, this, thus the Jewish people sealed their rejection of God's ministry. Now I looked up this text in the Christ Object Lessons and I'd like to read the sentence before that because it's very significant. It says, there was a great persecution, quoting Acts 5.1, many both of men and women were thrust into prison and some of the Lord's messengers as Stephen and James were put to death. So the context of this statement, thus the Jews sealed their rejection of, of God's mercy, came at the time of Stephen stoning, which was, again, coming back to Daniel Prophecy. chapter 9, mm -hmm. prophesied that they would be cut off at the end of the 490 years. Mm -hmm. And that's very interesting when we take the text found in Matthew chapter 12, uh, they're reading verses 31 and 32, um, particularly verse 32. Whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Yep. And that is very significant because when they Absolutely. crucified Christ, they did it, many of them, ignorantly. But when the things became real and they saw that he was really the Son of God and resurrected, many repented. But there were others who, against the Holy Spirit, rejected the message. Right. And that is when the Jewish nation committed the sin against the Holy Spirit, knowingly, willingly, persistently rejecting Christ as Messiah and condemned Stephen to death. The Jewish nation was cut off yep. as a singular people of God and the gospel went to the Gentiles. And at the end of time, the world is going to face the same basic situation because God will not condemn the world until it actually commits that sin against the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Sister Raquel? Yes, I think when uh, the people declare, we don't have any other king, only Caesar, mm. and the blood of this need to fall upon us and our children, they prophesy their own future. Mm -hmm. And if we connected this with the second commandment, it's extremely interesting because the second commandment say, you shall not make yourself an idol in the form of anything and so forth, not to have any other God beside me. Mm -hmm. And they say, uh, you shall not bow down to them or worship them for I am the Lord your God and I'm a jealous God, punishing the children from the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So why? Because they took the same decision as the parents. And mm -hmm. the spirit of prophecy yeah, tells us, and you already mentioned, the other op uh, option that they was giving was in Acts chapter 2. 238 particularly. Right. And they react and say, what shall we do? <laughs> so all the people that was not clear in the moment when the decision was taken, they have another opportunity. That's right. But when they persist in this, persist. This fulfillment from the second mm -hmm. commandment came in act. Right, 237 and 238. What Absolutely. shall we do? Be, yes. Repent and be baptized and you shall be forgiven. So we have now this whole scenario and we're trying to make an application to ourselves because what do we study these lessons for? To motivate ourselves in the love of God to be obedient and faithful in little things so when the big things come, we can stand for the Lord. Now. Mm -hmm. We're going to go now to the historical aspect of what happened after the early church went through this, re this birth, we have to say, not rebirth, because it was a birth of something that happened. And we find that Paul had to face uh, some of the worst despots of all time, and uh, Nero was, was that person. So from the time of Nero, um, how did Rome treat the followers of Christ? Very interesting, because they're actually finding... Uh, making their own destiny by the rejection of the truth. Mm -hmm. Yes, when you read many writings from this time, people believe that Nero was the Antichrist. And when you read Catholic sources today, they cite Nero as the Antichrist, Caesar. 
And Nero was a problematic person. I mean, he killed his mother. He killed Seneca, his teacher. And he killed so many people. He killed Paul. He heard Paul. Paul spoke before him mm -hmm. two times. The first time, Nero didn't want to free him, but he had to because Paul had really uh, given such a discourse and God had moved even upon Nero that he had to free him. And during this time, Paul had an influence upon the family of Nero. Some of his relatives yes. were converted. Yeah. And the testimonies here tell us that it's because people were converted from his own household that he took a special hatred against the Christians of that era. And Tacitus tells us, who is a Roman historian of the first century, he says that Nero had Christians burnt at the stake on the road of Rome. All the roads lead to Rome. And on some of those roads, they would put sta stakes up and they would burn the Christians at night. They were martyrs, martyrs. And great numbers were thrown to amphitheaters. I was in the Colosseum, which is one of the seven wonders of the world today. And when you go inside the Colosseum, you see this big cross standing as a memorial of those who were killed. Although the tour guides will tell you, no, no Christians were killed there, but I don't accept that. The Christians were killed all over and, and in many places. And you can see the, the bottom of the Colosseum where they had all these animals for, for the, uh, to come out into the scenery. And it was, the amphitheaters were filled with people applauding and laughing and they would raise their finger up, let him live, or they would turn it down, let him be killed. And I tell you, we, we read about these Romans when we say they were savages. They were uncivilized. Now they call the barbaric tribes barbarians, but who was the greater barbarians? My, but well, we think have... of us in our own time. When we sit before a TV, when we sit before video games, enjoying violence as an entertainment, the Romans considered violence as entertainment. We are like Rome today. And as Rome was destroyed, so today. As Nero did not fulfill all the requirements of the Antichrist. He was an Antichrist in a sense. Yes, that he, he stood was. against Christ. Mm -hmm. But there is a greater Antichrist that will take the, the scene in these last days. And God's people need to prepare for being faithful. I want to quote this uh, verse. It says, Paul says, we are fools for Christ's sake. We are weak and despised. We are buffeted. We're appointed unto death. Jesus told a parable about a seed that was sown. And when it sprouted out and the sun came out, it withered away because it didn't have any root. If we don't have the root in Christ, the persecutions of this life, will lead us to abandon the faith like many Christians abandon the faith during this time. I'd like to point out, too, that we, uh, as preachers, need to be careful that we are not uh, describing these things in such great detail. We're actually, in ourselves, putting before the people this, uh, these terrible crimes. Because we can talk against, you know, watching violence and blood but if we also portray these things, we are participating in that to a certain degree. We need to be careful of that. Now, we're going to drop back to the prophecy of Daniel again uh, because that prophesied this time. The vision of the Roman Empire. How did prophecy portray the end of the Roman Empire? When was this iron monarchy divided? And I want to emphasize again, it was divided because it itself had... Uh, this was a slow, torturous death that it was going through. Sister Raquel, would you like to help us with this uh, sixth question? Yeah. Um, Daniel 2, verse 33 and verse 41 presented us in a very uh, short form one process that approximately took 300 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, the disintegration of the West uh, Roman Empire uh, was a matter of time. Uh, the cruelty that uh, the Roman emperors used for what they call barbarians, the north tribes mm -hmm. that came near to the borders of the Danube and also to the Rhine, that was the official borders for the yeah. Roman Empire and Europe, 
um, have a very interesting process because first they made alliance with them because they needed more soldiers in order to confront one other part of the of the uh, border, especially with Gallia, that mm -hmm. began also in rebellion. Gaul, so, we call it in English, Gallia. Gaul. Gaul, no. Gaul, thank you. So we see that this alliance process, accompanied with cruelty, especially in the case of the uh, goats, the busy goats, after with Alaric, mm -hmm. that was the first that uh, have the courage to confront Rome, mm -hmm was because he was educated 20 years in the Roman militia. Mm -hmm. So, and this uh, give him enough power to understand not only the strategy to work, but also the civil laws in order to have the gods, the Visigoths, mm -hmm. after become the Visigoths and also the Ostrogoths, but originally were only one tribe, the gods. So uh, I recommended to see uh, one video from um, historic, uh, from historical point of view about the goats that mm. is from the British Encyclopedia and it's in Yahoo, and explain very good the process how Alaric mm -hmm. um, was educated by Romans as a soldier that went voluntary, mm -hmm. and then uh, worked against them. So. He used, uh, he understood how they thought, how they fought, uh, yes. and how they, what they, what they would, what he, what he expected them to do, and he used that material, that information, yes. uh, in his war against them. And of course, there were other factors involved, and that is because of all the oppression, the corruption, mm -hmm. the cruelty, and so forth. People began to not get what they want from the government, and therefore the the system fell down because of the internal strife and also the immorality. Immorality, you, you hit it there. Immorality is the cause of the fall of Rome right. and of every empire. All right, so we have here the symbols that indicate what would happen to the fall of Rome. They will try to stick together like clay and iron, but it will not cleave one to another. And of course we have the other prophecies uh, that we find here in, in the seventh part of our lesson, the seventh question, which are very, very interesting when we come down to our day. What does history present about the division of the Roman Empire? What are men still trying to do, even today? Trying to reunite the Roman Empire. When Karl Amain was able to fight in favor of the papacy, he was made the emperor of the Roman Empire. They've always, there have been men that have tried to reunite uh, Europe. Even now, Europe is trying to be reunited through the euro, through the euro. E economically. So according to prophecy, it cannot cover all of Europe or it will fail mm -hmm. with time. It may have a few years of success, but it is against prophecy. It cannot be united. It must remain part clay and part um, strength. And I want to say something, Brother Watts. When Edward Gibbons wrote his Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. It was the time that here in the United States, the revolution was taking place under the leadership of George Washington. Mm -hmm. And back in England, people were so fascinated by this monumental work of Edward Gibbons that they gave more attention to reading the Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire than to the Revolutionary War. Wow. And it was kind of like a strategic moment because it was letting England know, which dominated the entire world, that that empire would also fall. They mm. could not retain that for the same reasons of that Rome fell because of their immorality, those issues would be affecting uh, England and causing the loss of their colonies around the world. And let me state that it was Queen Victoria who after, who in the 1800s was tried to reunite Europe through marriage. Her children were related to other children, to 
those in Russia to those in England which, which to those. Which period of time are you talking about? Uh, Queen Victoria, 1800s. Okay, the yeah. 1800s. Very interesting because yep. at the time of the First World War, all the monarchies in Europe were related through, I believe, this relationship. Queen Victoria had much to do with that. Her descendants, they wanted to keep the power mm -hmm. among them, among these uh, noble families. And what do you have? You have hemophilia showing up, yeah. which Other was things. a big factor in um, Russia. Yeah, Peter the Great. It, with the different uh, czars that mm -hmm. govern there, uh, Alexander, the czar. And this disease of hemophilia, you cut yourself and then you're missing the necessary proteins in order to close the wound. And so people bleed to death and affects the men, not the women. Women are carriers. Men are sufferers. Mm. So we see the prophecy stated that it would be in part iron and in part clay, and Hitler failed, and Napoleon failed, and Carlemagne also failed, and Queen Victoria failed, and everyone who has ever tried to unite Europe has failed and will fail. Now, as we read the note, I would like to comment that there are ten groups here, and there is some discussion over the Huns, whether they were one of the tribes or the Alemanni. That was a big debate between Jones and Uriah Smith. Yeah. But to try to assign just one country in Europe to one of these tribes is misleading. Let me give you a couple of examples. For example, the... Uh, Lombards were in Austria, but they were also in northern Italy. The um, Burgundians, they were not only in France, but also in Germany. Mm -hmm. And so with many of these tribes, uh, the Anglo-Saxons, the Anglos were from England, the Saxons were from Germany, and they migrated to, mm -hmm. to England. So to try to say, okay, this tribe just governed this land in Europe that we know today is, is erroneous. We must understand that the Roman Empire broke down into these ten tribes, mm -hmm. which eventually became the countries in Europe. Right. And prophecy was fulfilled. At one time, there were these ten major countries. Well, there's more than ten countries now, but so they were Portugal's part of that, and so the Anglo-Saxons were mostly in England, but not only, and as you said, the Burgundians and Lombards were in different parts, so we can see that this is, you can't really assign it exactly. Well, we're going to close our lesson now, but before we close, I'd like to give Sister Raquel the closing remarks and ask her if she can kind of summarize the history of the fall of the Roman Empire um, and uh, show the consequences and maybe lead us to the point of making some applications for our lesson today about those who stood up against Jesus Christ and those who were faithful for him and what was the result. Thank you. Uh, the Roman Empire, when we speak in this lesson, we need to concentrate especially in the Western Roman Empire. So we are concentrated mm -hmm. in this area because it was not divided. But in the image uh, at this time, uh, we see always these two sections that afterwards was divided. But this lesson uh, speak only about the end of the Western Roman Empire in 476. Why this empire came was the result of the division of the Greek Empire that became the Hellenistic Empire divided between the four generals of Alexander. So when um, in year 67, before Christ, the province of Judea was conquered by the Roman Empire. Um, was not only the preparation of the fulfillment of the first question, but also was the um, shadow of the end. Yes, of the Hebrew nation. Mm -hmm. So we find not only Daniel 2, but we need to connect this with Daniel 9, and at the same time with Matthew 2 and with Luke 2. So when we put us together and, and we find the wonderful correlation between the Old and the New Testament, we see that Jesus was the middle point of this situation because the relation to Jesus from the Hebrew nation and also from the Roman Empire mm -hmm. 
was the most important point for both. Mm -hmm. So the Hebrew, the youth nation uh, rejected Jesus completely. And the Roman Empire confirmed, confirmed. this rejection. Yes. So in this way, the seal was given for, for both. Mm -hmm. And the degradation of the Roman Empire uh, was completely, uh, approximately took 400 years since this decision that was taken when Jesus was condemned to death. But this disintegration prepared then also the new spiritual Western Roman Empire that will lead also to the destruction of this planet at the end. So there's a chain of events which have laid itself in history which we are facing today. Uh, cause and effect has brought us to the point where we are today. And you know, we have, uh, Jesus says the sea's roaring, the last thing he says, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and we just have today another tsunami. Uh, uh, you know, Friday, uh, I should say, uh, we woke up to the news that Japan is suffering. Mm -hmm. We just had uh, Christchurch in New Zealand and other things are happening and people are asking what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so we, ha we live in a time when people are interested in uh, things uh, that are happening in the earth and they're asking, is this all there is? Because we're living in a time where I believe, uh, many believe, and many more are believing that Christ is coming again. People are waking up to that and we need to wake up to our responsibilities as well and present him as the message and the messenger from heaven today. May the Lord see more um, of us standing on his side and may the Lord help us as we go into this uh, lesson, as we study it together as a church, to realize our personal responsibility. Where does that begin? In the little things. Let's be faithful in that which is little, and God will also have people who will stand for him in that which is much. May God bless you as you study this lesson in your own churches, and may he help us all to be united in Jesus Christ. Let us lift him up before the world is our prayer in his name. We'll close with silent prayer, please. Well, thank you for joining us. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Really thank appreciated you very much, your, your appreciation, thank you. your uh, contribution.